Hey, 42 here. For most of us, when we're people watching, the normal thoughts that come into our heads are, I wonder where they're going. Is that a couple? Are they wearing those clothes for a dare? But there are a select few of us whose first thought when they spot a face in the crowd is mustard or gravy. Human meat, the great forbidden delicacy, has been eaten throughout history because of rituals, desperate bids for survival, curiosity, and when Tesco ran out of horse meat. Cannibalism, or anthropophagy as it's officially known, is still practiced today in places like Indonesia New Guinea, but has generally been the last resort of those with no other choice, like when you're stuck up a mountain or adrift on the ocean. So, where does the law stand on this, and how about your doctor? How would he feel about literally taking your pound of flesh? Today we find out, can you eat people? In most parts of the world, there has been an extreme disdain for cannibalism, which you can see reflected in the myths and folklore that's used as an example of truly depraved behaviour, such as in Hansel and Gretel and stories of the witch Baba Yaga. In Greek mythology, Tantalus was punished for boiling up his son Pelops and serving him to the gods. He was sent to the deepest corner of the underworld, and his fitting castigation was that when he was hungry and grasped for a grape, it was always just too high, and the water below him always shrunk away whenever he tried to quench his thirst. This is where we get the word tantalising, something that is just out of reach. For those tribes that did indulge in the practice of cannibalism, it was either to absorb the power of those that they had killed, such as the strength of rival warriors, or it was a process of grieving and would be done to the bodies of friends and family members. I am assuming the flowers were used as some sort of side salad. Many sieges throughout history, such as Jerusalem in 70 AD and the First Crusades, have reports of soldiers and civilians having to cannibalise the fallen when all supplies have been exhausted. In World War II, during the 872-day assault on Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, the police had to form an anti-cannibalism division, which was only slightly more popular than traffic duty. Well, would you want to give a ticket to a tank? Of course, human beings are not alone in this merry sport. There are plenty of animal species who will happily chew their way through their odd cousin, such as the usually vegetarian hippos who were found chomping on a decaying hippo carcass during a very difficult year. But for some species, especially at the early stages of development, cannibalism is programmed to kick in, depending on the environment, as a form of species preservation. When tiger salamanders are born, if there's not too many larvae, then they all develop nice and friendly, and remember to buy each other socks for Christmas. But at some point, when it all gets a bit overcrowded, then a random selection start growing with a broader head and triple length teeth, and rather than chasing the normal dinner of aquatic invertebrae, they devour the smaller salamanders, who are the most nutritious available meal around. They have cannibalism coded into their DNA to make sure that at least some of the offspring survive when there's not enough food to go around. It's a bit like a mother of five throwing two cheeseburgers into a kitchen and then locking all the doors. Ignore the screaming, it's for their own good. And if you think that's mean of mum, well nature has its own revenge plans there. If you didn't think spiders were already awful enough, the crab spider mother lays extra unfertilised eggs for her young to eat. But greedy sideways walking sticky string spewing agents of Satan that they are, it's not enough and they also eat their own mother over a few weeks. Honestly, this generation. No respect. This is called matrifagy, which means mother eating, and well, I'll just let you go ahead and make your own joke there. So, back to humans. Unlike these salamanders and spiders, us humans are clearly not genetically designed to eat our own flesh. So, is it safe? In the 1930s, Australian gold prospectors discovered that there was a huge population of native people living in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, an area where we had thought to be relatively empty before then. Over the next few decades, as researchers began to spend time with these people, they found there was a very mysterious disease that was killing around 200 of them a year in the 11,000 strong Four tribe. It was known as Kuru, meaning trembling. 
since sufferers will quickly lose control over their limbs, as well as their emotions. Once it took hold, it took about a year before they were completely incapacitated. The obvious suspicion was that it was some rare genetic condition that had been passed down within the small DNA pool of the tribe. But as they tracked the victims, they realised that there was a correlation with social groups, but not with genetic groups. So there must be an environmental reason for the disease. And of course, you have already guessed what it was. The four believed that it was better to eat their dead than to leave it as food for the worms. So they whipped up a cranial stew of brain, fern and bamboo, whilst the rest of the body was roasted over the fire. It's thought that at some point, one of the four must have developed CJD, the human form of mad cow disease. And then that was spread through the tribe, not as a virus or bacteria, but by eating the brain prions of other tribe members, which is a messed up kind of protein. This method of transmission could take decades to take hold and begin the mysterious Kuru. So from a doctor's point of view, eating humans is probably right up there with smoking, drinking super-sized sodas, and that thing you do when the doors close. It makes you go blind, apparently. Doctors is one thing, but what about lawyers? Do they enjoy the taste of human? I mean, is it, from a legal perspective, okay to consume another person? Obviously, killing people is off the table, that's not okay. But can you take a nibble on a corpse if you come across one in the forest, per se? And what about in the case of desperation? Much of the ruling that exists is built around a law school classic called Regina vs Dudley and Stevenson's from 1884, with Regina being Queen Victoria at that point. A ship called the Mignone was sailing from Southampton to Sydney when it hit a gale near the Cape of Good Hope, and they had to abandon ship, ending up in a lifeboat with just some navigation equipment and two tins of turnips. There were four people in total. The captain, Tom Dudley, two sailors, Edwin Stevensons and Edmund Brooks, and a 17-year-old cabin boy named Richard Parker. After two days, they ate the first tin of turnips. I'm sure it was very delicious. A couple of days later, they managed to kill a turtle, and this, along with the other turnip tin, let them survive to almost two weeks at sea. Richard Parker fell very ill, and slipped into a probable coma. After much discussion, and almost 20 days in the lifeboat, Dudley pushed his penknife into the boy's neck, while Stevens held his legs. Both claimed that Brooks had agreed to this, but he denied it. They all ate the dead boy, and four or five days later, they were rescued. They told the truth when they came back to England, and a major case ensued, with Brooks turning against the two other men as state's witness. Both Dudley and Stevens were found guilty of murder and sentenced to death, although they were eventually released after six months in prison thanks to the Home Secretary, William Harcourt. So, killing for food in case of emergency is not okay, apparently. But what about cannibalism without the killing part? Canadian artist Rick Gibson, obviously having run out of paint and canvases, decided to eat the flesh of another person in public. In 1988, he ate a canapé made out of donated tonsils in London, and the UK has no specific law against this. The next year, though, he set the bar even lower when he ate a human testicle, when he tried the same thing in Vancouver but they confiscated his snack and charged him with publicly exhibiting a disgusting object. But the case was dropped, and having waited almost two months, he hungrily finished his lunch on the courthouse steps after the verdict. The media went nuts. I mean, they had a ball. Oh, never mind. All in all, it's a good thing that the social taboo and the medical dangers have kept us from snacking on our friends and family. But to keep temptation at a minimum, make sure you never sit too near the fire, and maybe rethink that bacon and maple syrup deodorant. You're just asking for trouble. Thanks for the view. Subscribe for more. 42. You may be either grossed out when I tell you this, or totally amazed, but inside the chrysalis, the caterpillar completely liquidizes. These are some of the most addictive and most dangerous recreational drugs in the world. But there's an even more dangerous drug.